Hello everyone, my name is Nagura and today I'm going to go over a Mythic Plus run that I did and I'm going to explain what I do and why I do it because a lot of people have been confused on how to play Mookin properly in M+. Disclaimer before we go into this, um, I did want to tell you that at the moment there is no like absolute perfect way on how you play Mookin. Like everyone kind of does it a little bit differently, even when it comes to talents and when it comes to playstyle. But I'm just going to go over how I'm playing it and what works for me. And maybe you can figure something out or maybe you can try it and see how it works for you. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to deal with the, the dungeon. Yeah, we're going to go over and academy run it was a 21 run so not too high of a key because i was thinking that uh, most people are not gonna run like 24 keys or whatever anyway so i picked a little bit of a lower key to show you how to do damage on those keys all right so first of all uh, i'm picking up the haste buff here haste is um a better buff than mastery because mastery is a flat um, amount while well, haste is a percentage which is uh, usually better and haste in general is a very good stat for moonkins on aoe all right so we're doing the tree area first here um sometimes you shroud to the left but we do the tree area first and we are pulling these skitters by themselves and i didn't notice because i'm not um communicating with them on voice chat and i didn't necessarily like look at the route that much um so i didn't know that we we're only pulling these skitters that's why i was holding my cooldowns here otherwise I mean, otherwise I probably would have held him anyway, let's be honest here. <laughs> but uh, I probably would have used like one uh, set of my mushrooms or would have used um, one set of my Fear Balloon before uh, we moved on. But uh, now let's talk about this Lasher Pool. So the problem here is that I actually still have Starfall up. I have two stacks of Starfall up while the tank is pulling, which is not ideal. You should try to not have starfall up when the tank is gathering these slashers otherwise you're gonna have aggro from all of them which is very annoying because they come from all of all directions now usually when you have aggro from some of them it's okay because you can just like kite them towards the tank but if you have aggro from all sides it's a bit annoying but yeah so usually try to not have it up now while the tank is gathering them up you should try to moonfire as many of them as possible um you can I do, I'm just clicking on the nameplates to make sure that the big lashes have Moonfire on them. Because the small lashes are obviously a lot less important and they have a lot less HP. So I'm trying to just Moonfire the big ones. And then when the tank is still gathering, while the big ones already have Moonfire, then I'm going to try to also uh, Twin Moon some of the small lashes as well. While the tank is still gathering, because you try to only cast sunfire one time you don't want to sit there and cast sunfire multiple times on one pool because that's just a waste of global so you're just moon firing until they're all stacked then you sunfire and then you can start your rotation now we do have explosive on this week uh, one thing that is really cool with explosives actually as a moonkin is if you explosive one of them twin moons prox um a moonfire on another mob that doesn't have a moonfire already which is pretty nice so you can help um the healer kills some of the explosives while the tank is gathering up to make sure because uh, it helps your damage as well right because it puts moon fires on the ads all right so you can see here i'm just casting a star fall because i was about to overcap and i'm still waiting for the lashes to to stack up i'm not gonna end up putting moonfire on all of them because as soon as they're stacked i just want to start doing damage on a really high key you could technically moonfire all of them even when they're stacked but i personally think it's not very efficient because big lashes are the ones with the most uh, hp and the small lashes are gonna die anyway so if you miss some moonfires and small ones it's probably whatever so now you can see they're all stacked up. I'm casting a Wrath to enter my um, Eclipse here, uh, which is something uh, I do first. Now, if the mobs die really quickly, you can just not enter Eclipse first at all. Usually entering Eclipse first makes sense because then you proc your Balance of All Things, you proc your Solstice, you proc your free four-piece Starfall, proc a bunch of stuff, right? So it's really nice to do so if you have the time. If the mobs die really quickly, then it wouldn't hurt either to just instantly press uh, Incarnation as well. But here I felt like I have the time to just enter Eclipse, so I'm doing that. Uh, then I use my free four piece proc on Starfall. And then I use my cooldowns immediately, use my Starfall again, and just dump my Astral Power into Starfalls uh, using my potion as well. And then I cast Mushrooms. As soon as I'm not going to overcap 
astral power anymore. And mushrooms is gonna apply waning twilight to all of the mobs that have sunfire and moonfire in them, which gives you the extra damage, of course. And then, of course, mushrooms also do a lot of damage themselves. And uh, now I'm really just trying to get star fires off whenever I have uh, umbral embrace procs and triple two piece stacks. Those star fires hit very hard, and it makes a lot of sense to try and get them off. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult on this pool because you have all of these swirlies on the ground that spawn. But if you can cast a starfire in between um, with those procs it's definitely worth it and while you're running around you can still reapply some moonfires to the ones that don't have moonfire on them already so like let's say a swirly spawns underneath your character and you cannot cast starfall and you don't want to cast mushrooms because you want to stagger the mushrooms right that's something i haven't talked about yet but um mushrooms shouldn't be all used at once like back to back because they enable your waning twilight, right? Even though mushrooms do stack damage, so technically, if you want to do a lot of damage like all at once, you can use your mushrooms back to back. But if the mobs don't die really quickly, it makes a lot more sense to just stagger your mushrooms to just keep your waning twilight buff on the mobs for longer. So you can see I'm not using all of the mushrooms immediately, but I'm definitely making sure that I'm keeping my um, waning up and as soon as I have to dodge these swirlies and run around I'm basically just reapplying moonfires on mobs that don't have um, moonfire on them then I just keep uh, using master power and starfall of course I am applying stellar flare on the big lashers I'm not gonna cast any stellar flares on the small lashers. I keep using my mushrooms whenever I see my waning is about to drop or my fungal growth is about to drop. And uh, then I'm just casting my star fires. Um, the build that I'm running is in the top uh, left side of my screen. If you haven't seen that yet, it is uh, the rattle and mushroom build that I'm running here, which I do think uh, makes a lot of sense in um, Academy specifically. I'm not saying that this build is like the best everywhere, but in Academy, I do think it makes a lot of sense. A lot of people also play Umbral Embrace actually in Academy, which also is totally viable. There's just a lot of different builds that people are running. I'm not really gonna go into the builds in this video just because uh, I think there's just like a bunch of different ones and people just, everything kind of works depending on how you play, depending on your route and your comp and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, this is the build that I'm running here. Now I did save my Pulsar proc here. I did that on purpose to make sure that uh, I have the Pulsar proc for the boss. This is something that a lot of Moonkins maybe don't necessarily look out for too much, but paying attention uh, at your Pulsar sex makes a lot of sense because you don't want to proc your Pulsar when the trash pack is about to die. Um, if you could just save it for next pull, right? Now you also don't want to hold on to it for like a minute or whatever, um, but holding on, um, to it for a little while makes a lot of sense. Now in this boss, of course, we're all stacking up here to spawn the ads uh, on top of each other. Now I do want to say quickly that uh, my UI or my plater is doing something weird here, I don't know why, but my dots are not showing on the lashers on the nameplates. Um, but I did dot them here with Sunfire, so as soon as they all spawned, make sure you don't spam Sunfire because they spawn in waves, the lashers, right? So Sunfire in once is enough. You don't have to sit there and like sunfire, 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 right? So once they're all spawned, you sunfire once. If the boss is not in the middle, then I sometimes target a lasher that in my opinion is in the middle of them to make sure that sunfire spreads on as many as possible. Because if you sunfire the boss and some lashers are like on the other side, then they might not get the sunfire splash on them and that's really annoying. Look at the position of the boss. If the boss is in the middle, perfect, sunfire the boss. If it's not in the middle, sunfire one of the lashers. And then what I do here when they spawn, I don't have cooldowns available, so I can't do like insane damage to them, but I do have my mushrooms, so I will be using mushrooms, um, I assume. Yeah, there we go. So I use my mushrooms and then I'm just casting my um, three stack Umbral Embrace Starfire to make sure I get that off. And then I get the branch spawning. Now the branch is really important on this boss. A lot of players don't necessarily focus the branch as much as they really should because those small lashers of course, it's nice to do a lot of damage to the lashes and they have to die, uh, but the branch is a lot more important. So as soon as this branch is up, you should be focusing damage on this branch. Even if there's still small lashes up, you shouldn't go around moon firing the lashers or trying to maximize your damage on the lashers. You should try to maximize the damage on the branch because while the branch is up, everyone has this bleed on them, which does a lot of damage and it needs to get 
removed as fast as possible, which happens when the branch dies. It spawns a green circle on the ground and it cleanses your bleed. So you make sure that you kill this as fast as you can, even as a moon can too. You see I proc my pulsar. I used Fury Balloon on the branch as well. And now I'm just gonna try to do as much single target onto this branch as possible, even wrathing um, instead of star firing to make sure I get as much damage. Then we, again, just sec up same thing over and over on this boss. This boss is always the same. The only difference is when you get the um, burst forth and that's when the lashers actually come out of the ground and start hitting the tank. Now, if that happens, you as a Moonkin can help out by dispelling the tank because it's a stacking poison that these lashers apply to the tank once they got out of the ground. So every melee attack is hit, is applying one of these sacks, kind of like necrotic, and you can dispel it as a Moonkin, so make sure you do that once in a while to help out the tank here. You can see I'm doing that right now, dispel the tank, and then I'm just continuing to do as much um, single target damage on the boss as possible, while also cleaving those lashers down, making sure my sunfires on them, making sure I'm casting um, Umbron Brace, Starfires um, to cleave them down and so on. And then this boss just continues to be the same thing over and over. I'm not gonna talk about it that much more. Of course, when you have your cooldowns up, then you can do a little bit more damage, but nothing necessarily changes that much. I'm just continuing to do damage on the boss while casting Starfalls. Most of the time with Master Power, I'm gonna cast Starfall here, not a Star Surge, just because you almost always have two targets. And whenever you have two targets, we cast Starfall over Star Surge. Unless one of the targets is a lot more important, then you can cast Star Surge on them. So whenever the branch is up, you can cast Star Surge on it. But that shouldn't really be needed. Like if everyone focuses it, then it shouldn't be needed for the Moonkin to cast the Star Surge, just because a star, Starfall still does a decent amount of single target damage as well, not just AoE. And uh, obviously it's gonna be a lot better for the Lashers and the boss damage as well. All right, so this boss uh, is done. Uh, we're gonna move on. Now this mini boss is actually a little bit awkward. Some people maybe don't know is that whenever this boss, <laughs> okay, my character just moved back here for no reason. I don't know what happened. <laughs> But yeah, whenever this boss casts these swirlies on the ground, um, the further away you are, they call it deadly winds, the further away you are, um, the later you actually see the swirly on the ground. So it's it's really awkward. I assume it's a bug. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to fix it or not. But this this tornado that spawns, the deadly winds, yeah? Sometimes there's uh, projectiles that have a travel time, right? So it spawns from the boss and then it like slowly like moves to your location. And I think that's what this tornado does, except that there is no animation of the tornado being thrown at you. The only indicator of the deadly winds actually spawning on you is the swirly on the ground. And that swirly on the ground seems to be having a travel time. So the further away you are, the later you actually see the swirly and the less time you have to react to run out of it. You might have died to this a few times and figured, oh my God, I'm just like bad at the game. I'm just like really slow or whatever. But if you don't like already move, like if you're not already moving when this is spawning, when you're in max range, you die. Like there's absolutely no way you can make it out in time if you only react. So there's a few things you can do to avoid this. Number one, if you stand far away, you can just start pre-moving as soon as you see the deadly winds cast and um, being ready. Now you can do this with big wicks or with DBM. They should both have a timer for this. So as soon as you see the cast like actually being available, then you just start moving. You can see my, I'm just moving. You see this? Because I know I'm far away. So after this AOE, I see the deadly winds is in two seconds. So I'm casting one more spell and I'm just like moving. So in case it does spawn on me, I'm already moving. Um, it didn't spawn on me, so I stopped moving. Uh, or the other thing you can do is just move close to the boss. Because if you move close, you'll see it earlier and then you have uh, an easier time to react. Another thing that people don't know here is that the AOE that this mob does is actually line of sightable. You don't have to walk all the way out from this animation. You can also just walk around the corner like I just did right there. And that makes it a little bit easier. Like if the tank tanks this mob close to a pillar, then you can stay close to melee as a range as well. You see now I had more time to react to this tornado. I didn't have to pre-move because I was so close to the sentry already. So I didn't have to do any of these pre-moving things. So therefore, if you can stay close to the boss, you should do so. All right, let's move on to the bird area. Here I actually tried to pull the birds, but they had fixed it. So these mobs are not targetable anymore. In the past, you were able to just moonfire them <laughs> and get them to the platform. Uh, but yeah, I was very confused. I was like, why can't I not attack them? But yeah, anyway, 
Uh, so we, here we have this eagle event where the multiple eagles spawn. You should try to do as much focus target damage to the big eagle just because it has the most HP and it has to die before the next wave spawns. Here what I'm doing, the first wave of eagles is already on the platform, the second wave is on the left side of the platform and the third wave is like on the back side of the platform. And while they fly in, you can already apply moon fairy to them, you just have to be careful with aggro. And sometimes if you if you attack the big eagle too early, it will start casting its frontal cast while still being halfway up in the air, which makes it a lot harder to see where it's going. So that is something you have to keep in mind, but it's still very much doable to like moonfire them while they're flying down, as you can see, I'm doing that right there. Then I'm entering my eclipse here. I'm applying sunfire as soon as they are stacked. This is something that you always wanna do, of course, uh, only sunfire when they're stacked, moonfire them while they're still spread out. Always proccing my pulsar with starfall, always using my um, four piece uh, bonus on either star search or starfall, depending on what I currently want to do, of course. I'm going to try to keep my star lord stacks up as much as possible. This is just like standard rotation things. Um, I'm going to try to keep my rattle up um, as much as I can. I'm going to try to use my um, mushrooms on cooldown to make sure they're not stacking on three stacks and to keep up waning when the eagles die really quickly or when generally mobs die really fast you can try to use your mushrooms a little bit faster just to get more damage out quicker but then at the same time uh, yeah I mean you can see I'm, uh, I'm, I'm casting some mushrooms here um actually i'm not oh my god i'm so ethical look at me yeah so i'm not like spamming my mushrooms here either <laughs> just because these eagles are dying fast i'm actually trying to maximize my damage on the two big eagles as you can see which uh does make sense when you think about it because the small eagles they're just gonna die like they're not super scary they they're they'll they will die so i'm applying my cellar flares onto the big eagles to make sure that uh, they get more they take more damage because they're the ones that have to die and while i do that i'm obviously also proccing my pulsars and i'm using my two set bonuses as well now some of the things that people maybe don't know so when you start a pool what should be should you be doing as a moonkin if you play this build that i'm running some things i already explained um make sure you cast moonfires first before they're stacked because uh, you only want to cast sunfire one time ideally right uh, dots are the most important thing almost always dots are incredibly important for moonkins just because our mastery is tied to it and gives us so much more damage so putting your dots up is incredibly important if you're in a situation where you start a pool and you have full astral power and you're not in an eclipse if that is your situation and people sometimes don't know what they should be doing should i be spending my astral power first to make sure i'm not over capping should i be casting spells first uh should i be casting dots first to make sure i get my damage up should i be entering eclipse first what should i be doing and the answer almost always is to apply your dots first even if you are at 100 astral power then you cast a starfall or a star search, depending on what you're doing, to make sure that you stop overcapping or stop wasting astral power. And then you enter your eclipse. All right, so that's what you do when you when you had 100 astral power. Now, if you're not at 100 astral power, then of course you still want to dot first. Uh, then you enter eclipse and then you do whatever else, because then you don't have to worry about overcapping, so you don't have to like cast a star fall before you enter. Now, if you're about to proc your pulsar, let's say you're starting a pool, you have 100 astral power, and your next star search or star fall would proc pulsar. If that's what, ha what your situation is, and you're not in an eclipse right now. So again, same situation as before, 100 astral power, you're not in an eclipse, you're starting a pool, and your next star search or star fall is a proccing pulsar. If that is the case, and your incarn is not ready, then what you do is you apply moonfire sunfires first, and then you just immediately enter pulsar. You do not enter lunar eclipse first. Uh, that free starfall that you're getting um, from your um, four piece is not worth it because you're just wasting astral power this whole time um, while entering eclipse. And that astral power that you're wasting is basically um, more valuable, or you're wasting more astral power than what you're gaining for entering that eclipse uh, for your free starfall proc and your free like other procs. And it's also just a waste of time. So this is the course of action that uh, you're supposed to do. Um, if you have incarn ready. And you have 100 astral power. Um, again, you want to cast your dots. You want to um, maybe cast a starfall first, and then enter your cooldowns immediately without entering your eclipse first. Now, if you 
are about to proc your pool star and your incarn is ready and you have 100 dash of power and you're uh, starting a pool then you apply your dots first then you cast your incarn and then you proc your pool star because in case you guys don't know if you proc pool star while you're inside an eclipse then it will extend your incarnation but if you use incarnation while a pulsar proc is already active, then you're overriding your pulsar proc. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to cast incarn while a pulsar proc is happening, but you can 100% um, proc your pulsar while incarn is running. In fact, you would prefer that from happening to elongate your cooldowns. All right, so this boss I didn't really talk about too much, just because there is nothing special, it's just a single target boss, really. One thing I do want to mention is that saving your cooldowns for the fire phase is not necessarily required. I personally never really do it, just because if you have cooldowns ready on pool of the boss, we have three minute cooldowns, right? This might be, this is very different for classes that have only two minute cooldowns. But with a three minute cooldown class, if we save our cooldowns for the fire phase, then we're gonna not have the cooldowns after the boss for this trash pool here, right? But if you use your cooldowns on pool of the boss, you will probably have them back up for this pool. As you can see here, my cooldowns are now in a 15 second CD, which means that I actually do have them up here. And you can see I still did a lot of damage to the boss, 85k DPS um, to the boss, so it's not that I was doing much worse. Something you can do if you want is you can save a pulsar proc for the fire phase if um, you don't have to hold it for too long. So if you can see the fire phase is about to come up or you're about to trigger the fire phase, then you can uh, save your pulsar and use it there. One more thing I also want to mention about any kind of damage increase on a mob. So if there's any mob that takes more damage, like a boss or even in the raid or whatever, then usually mushrooms are very good to use there. In case you guys remember in Shadowlands when we had Ravenous Frenzy with mushrooms, there was this um, bug where they were like double dipping with your damage increase and stuff, right? And there's still some things that are like double dipping and there's also like your dot is also like snapshotting, which makes a lot of sense. Your fungal growth does percentage based damage of how much damage your initial mushroom did. So using mushrooms for these like damage amps or whatever, um, usually it's really nice. The new mushrooms is gonna be a big portion of your damage because for one GCD and then your fungal growth is gonna do eight seconds of damage even outside of the um, damage amp is still going to be buffed from the damage amp because it's just percentage based. So um, usually using mushrooms for, for the bird face or the fire face makes a lot of sense. All right, now going to this pool. Um, here we have, we are pulling the foragers, um, the ravager, uh, battle axes, scepter, and so on. I was actually, oh no, 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 wait. I just realized, I, I remembered this. Um, so we ended up not pulling the ravager pack, which I didn't, like I didn't know. So I was basically stuck on this side now because everyone else walked past the Ravager pack and I was already applying my Moonfires while we were gathering, so I was a bit behind. And you can see this Ravager pack is now kind of cutting off my path, so I'm a bit uh, in a bad spot here. One more thing I wanted to mention that I did here that people might be asking. So here's where you're gathering, yeah? I'm applying my Moonfire first, which of course uh, ends up um, putting Twin Moons on the other. And now at this point, I'm in a situation where, okay, so what do I do now? Because if I sunfire them, I'm gonna have to sunfire again afterwards. So I'm like kind of wasting a global. So what I decided to do here is actually cast Stellar Flare. Because Stellar Flare is uh, obviously a good ability, which gives you extra astral power and also procs your waning. And usually on a pool like this, you don't really have the time to apply Stellar Flare. So I'm applying it while we gather until I have more mobs in range for me to cast Moonfire on. Of course, Moonfire and Sunfire is much more important than Stellar Flare, but because I felt like I'm not really going to be in range to these other foragers, I just decided to um, cast a Stellar Flare here. And now I realize that these, this Ravager pack is coming close, so now I'm just confused walking back. I'm out of range of the trash pack, so I can't really do damage here, which sucks because my cooldowns will be ready. I could be doing a lot of damage here, but yeah, I didn't know the route. I didn't realize we were skipping this Ravager pack. Now, one thing I wanted to mention as well, because uh, in this run we are never pulling a Ravager pack. The Ravager is like this big worm here. I do want to say something that you can do. The way this Ravager works is that it will target the furthest person with this like blue uh, like circle and then it will charge you, knock you in the air and then it will do a frontal. Now this cast can actually be completely avoided if you just line of sight it while the cast is um, on you. 
Now the way it works is it will always target the furthest person. So if you are the furthest person, it can bait the charge on you. And while it's casting, you just walk behind line of sight and it will stop the cast. And it will not do it again until the cooldown is ready again. So you can completely avoid this Ravager from, from charging, which is really good on 45 keys for multiple reasons. Number one, the charge is a lot of damage. And number two, the Ravager is like charging out of the pack, which is really a uh, damage loss. Uh, you can line up sighted like here where the pillars are, where my mouse is right now. You can even walk, like if you are on the bridge, like if the Ravager is right here where he's right now, then you can stand over there, bait it, and then walk behind this pillar. It's hard to see right now because the weaker is covering it, but you just walk behind here a little bit and you're fine. But yeah, so here I'm just like griefing because I can't reach the pack. As soon as I can get over there, I'm applying my sunfires, my moonfires. Uh, I do have thundering as well that I have to get rid of in a second. So yeah, I'm just at this point I'm just saving my cooldowns because the mobs are basically already dead. Alright, then we move on and pull this bridge pack here. This can be very dangerous. There's a battle axe, a scepter, and two mana fiends. The scepters cast a really dangerous uh, cast that has to be interrupted. Then the battle axe casts a bleed on the tank that can only be disrupted, but it's really fast cast and it puts a bleed on the tank. You can see it right here. It does uh, an insane amount of damage. You, as a moonkin, you can disrupt it with uh, Inca Broar. So if you ever feel like your tank is about to die, just look at that um, battle axe and try to Inca Broar the bleed if you can. And yeah, this is where I'm using my cooldowns. Now, it's a little bit annoying to use my cooldowns here just because there's only four mobs and we are actually dragging it over, but I don't want to hold my cooldowns for that long. So I'm basically just applying my Moonfires, apply my Sunfire. Now I'm entering an Eclipse because I'm not full Astro Power, so I'm not worried about overcapping anything, yeah? And I'm not about to, to proc pulls either because I'm on 5 at 30 and you proc it at 600. So I can enter Eclipse here, cast the free Starfall, then enter Incarn and then proc pull. So that's my course of action here. I hope that's actually what I'm doing. <laughs> right, yeah, so I'm casting my Starfall. There we go. Cast a Starfall, use Incarnation, Nature's Vigil Berserking. Then I just spend my Starfalls until I'm not capping Astral Power anymore. Then I'm gonna, I assume I'm using my Mushroom here. Oh, actually, I'm waiting with my Mushroom a little bit because we pulled some more Foragers here. So we pulled more Foragers. Now I'm gonna apply Moonfire Sunfire to them. I had to make sure I get my dots up. And now I'm gonna just be casting my uh, mushrooms. I even casted two mushrooms back to back because I felt like this pull is dying too quickly. <laughs> then I use my Starfire with my triple two set proc plus umbral proc. And uh, yeah, then I'm just, I just keep Starfiring. I keep trying to get my rattle up. I'm actually casting some Stellar Flare as well. So in case you're wondering how to cast Stellar Flare, the rule of thumb is, and this is sometimes more or less true just you know no one knows when to sell a flare perfectly let's just throw it out there but in my opinion what i do and you can try to do this or not whatever you want but the way i do it is i only cast sell a flare if there's um like eight or less mobs all right or if there's like a proitatory mob right like even if there's 20 mobs like for example earlier in the lasher pool they were like 50 mobs, right? But the three big lashes, they're the highest priority, so casting Stellar Flare and them makes sense. But um, if there's more than eight mobs and they all have equal priority and equal health, then I would not cast Stellar Flare at all. If there's less than eight mobs, you do want to cast Stellar Flare. And the rule of thumb is that you, or that's what I do at least, I cast Stellar Flares if I would cast an unbuffed Starfire otherwise. And not a completely unbuffed one, but like less than two stacks of two piece. When we talk about Starfire buffs, right, we have two Starfire buffs. We have Umbral Embrace procs, and we have the two set stacks, right? So the way I do it is if I have less than two two stack procs, a uh, two set procs or stacks, and I do not have an Umbral Embrace proc, and I'm not overcapping astral power, and I'm not, uh, I don't have to enter eclipse, and I don't have to do anything else. So, like, let, so I already have moonfires up, I have sunfires up. I'm not overcapping astral power, I'm in an eclipse already. I already casted my mushrooms, I casted my fury balloon. If all of those things are true, and I do not have a number of embrace proc, and I do not have two or more two set procs, then I will cast stellar flare. Right? So, that's very, those are very like specific conditions. 
So keep that in mind. It basically means that you almost never cast Stellar Flare unless those very specific conditions come true. And it does come true on this pool here. It usually happens when your Incarn is up because when your Incarn is up, you, don't, you have to enter Eclipse less often and therefore you usually have more time. And you can see it happening right here. So once these foragers come in, I'm applying Sunfire and Moonfire to them. Um, all right, now that all of them have my dots, I'm casting Starfall to make sure I'm not overcapping anymore, which by the way is also not necessarily correct. Sometimes just ignoring your Astra power and casting your Mushrooms and your Starfire makes more sense as well, especially if the mobs die quickly. Because your Starfall, yes, does a lot of damage, but if you look at in a if you look at Starfall at like a singular cast of Starfall and you compare it to a singular cast of Mushrooms or a singular cast of Starfire with procs then those will do a lot more damage than this one single starfall, right? But here in this case, I did cast uh, my starfall and now um, I'm casting my mushroom and I'm casting my, my starfire with my umbral proc here. And then I'm casting my starfall again. And now I'm in a situation where I only have one two set stack and I don't have astral power to cast another um, starfall. So technically speaking in this situation, I should be casting a Stellar Flare. I'm not sure if I end up doing it. Okay, I actually casted a Starfire. See, that was actually the wrong thing to do. I casted a Starfire, even though I should have casted a Stellar Flare on one of those high HP foragers. Now I realized, okay, so now I stopped casting Starfire and I'm actually casting a Flare. I'm casting, again, another Starfire that I casted here, which was not the best play either. I think I did it to extend my Rattle stack, so which I guess you could argue makes sense because uh, keeping up Rattle makes a, like is pretty valuable and Stellar Flare gives less Astro power than casting a Starfire. So maybe I was thinking if I cast a Starfire, I can get another Starfall up to keep my uh, Rattle up. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so at this point you can see I'm definitely casting more flares because of this like very unique situation that I'm in. But otherwise, throughout the dungeon you see I'm barely ever really casting flares unless the mobs live for a long time and I have these like very unique situations where I don't have anything else to do. Now one more thing I want to mention is that um, Starfire Splash Damage does more damage than the Starfire does on the main target. So the way Starfire works is you target a mob, you cast Starfire on it, and then it splashes damage around your target, right? And we have numerous uh, like kind of abilities and uh, passives and whatever that will increase our splash damage of Starfire, but not our direct hit of Starfire. This actually means that our splash does more damage than our um, direct hit, which means that if there's a trash pull that you're doing, and there's a mob that is higher priority, then technically speaking, you want to target an off target to do more damage to the main target. And this is something that, um, of course, don't do that if you're confused by Moonkin and you don't know what you're doing, but if you're like more advanced and you're like more comfortable with uh, how you're playing a game and whatever, and also like, this is usually also easier in smaller pulls, right? If you, if you only pull like three mobs and one of them has more HP, then it's, it's easy to like figure out, oh, I should be targeting an off target, right? Of course, if you pull 10 mobs and one has more HP, then it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's chaotic because there's so many other things you have to do with your dots and blah, 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 right? But if there's like a little bit, if it's a bit more calm and you have more time to, to figure out what you're supposed to do, then make sure you target an off target. All right, so let's talk about this big pull here as well. And uh, let's go back for a little while. So we're pulling these, um, the, the, the right side plus the left side here on this platform. Uh, again, I kind of anticipate that we're moving to the left here because I can see the tank move. So I'm not sand firing already. Usually here you would sand fire if this is the only pull you do, because as soon as you hit every mob with sand fire, you want to actually also cast it, right? But I can kind of anticipate that we're moving over. So I'm just applying my moon fires here. And I think I'm also, yeah, I'm casting one wrath. Because we haven't pulled... Okay, so here, right? I'm casting both of my Moonfires. Now, if you're in this, this situation, I think a lot of Moonkins would probably just cast Sunfire here, right? Because I casted both of my Moonfires already, and the best next thing to do would be casting Sunfire, right? But because I know that we're pulling this other pack, and that if I cast Sunfire now, I would have to cast it again later. So 
what I am doing here is I'm actually casting a wrath because I know that I want to enter eclipse after I have applied my dots. So, so I'm casting a wrath here. Now we have pulled the other mobs. So now I'm applying my moonfires to the other mobs. And now I'm applying sunfire to all of them, right? And now that um, I have my dots on all of it, I'm gonna enter Eclipse, I'm gonna enter Pool Star, I'm gonna use my mushroom, and I'm gonna start casting um, my um, Starfires, my triple stack Umbro and Brace Starfires, which are gonna be doing a lot of damage. Here, I'm not actually casting flares, I don't think. The reason for that is because I feel like there's just like a lot of mobs and they're about to die really quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh yeah, there's a battle axe here behind. Okay, so there's eight mobs. Technically, uh, you can cast Stellar Flare here as well, but I feel like they're just dying pretty fast. So casting Stellar Flare, in my opinion, uh, didn't seem like the best thing. Actually, I did cast one of them on this Mana Fiend, which was the highest HP target. When did I do that? I wanna go back. I I cast a Flare. Oh, I actually just randomly casted a Flare here. I think they must have made it. That definitely must have been just like a misclick. <laughs> or like the wrong spell to press. Because I had uh, an Umbra proc plus a three stack uh, two piece. So casting Stellar Flare here was definitely the wrong play. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I could have casted it after I used my Starfire. But not before. That was, uh, that was not the correct thing to do. But yeah, then I end up not um, really casting any more flares it looks like. Just using my two piece stacks um, to get my... Uh, spells out. I'm trying to. I'm actually using Inca Broad to interrupt a little bit here using um, Sunfire as well. Some of these spells are very, very dangerous if they go off. So I'm trying my best here to actually help interrupt and to help um, CC them up so we don't end up dying. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I talked about AoE pulls a lot now. So let's just move on with uh, the rest of the dungeon. I think we're pulling some Ravagers. Oh, this is another interesting thing. I guess we can talk about this as well. Again, what the tank is doing here is the tank is pulling two mobs and then moves all the way over to pull another trash pack. And in that situation, uh, there's just so much time for you to deal with things. So what I'm doing here is, again, I put Moonfire on them. Now I'm casting Stellar Flare because I know that these mobs um, are actually going to take a while to, to gather up. Then I'm casting one of my rafts because I'm about I want to enter eclipse or I want to get closer to entering my eclipse. Because technically speaking, you always want to enter eclipse after you apply your dots. Okay. So the, again, the course of action is the dots first, then starfall if you would overcap astral power. Otherwise, if you wouldn't be overcapping astral power, then enter eclipse, and then you would cast mushrooms unless you're overcapping, right? Alright, so again, I'm casting my Moonfires here, I see her gathering, casting my Sunfire, entering Eclipse, casting my Starfalls, casting my Fear of Loon. I'm gonna be casting a Mushroom very soon. Actually, I casted a Starfire before a Mushroom, so it was a mistake. And <laughs> you can see it, that I am also like making uh, mistakes, right? It's not that I'm playing this perfectly, because it is pretty complicated. So here, uh, if, you, if you look at this, I'm entering my Eclipse, I'm casting my Starfall, I'm casting one more Starfall, it looks like. And now, in this situation, I should probably be casting a Mushroom and then use my big Starfire. Because I have a big Starfire, right? I have an Umbral proc and a triple two-set proc, right? So getting the Waning Twilight on all of them would have made more sense here, in my opinion. Now looking at it in hindsight. The only time... I guess sometimes with Umbral procs, it's also a little bit difficult because you don't want to waste them either, right? So technically speaking, you want to get your big Starfires out. So, in my opinion now, casting mushrooms first would have made sense. But then, if I would have wasted an umbral proc, if I casted mushrooms first, then maybe it wouldn't have been worth it, right? So, I'm not even sure what the better course of action here is, right? Because sometimes wasting umbral procs is bad, and it's not worth it to just get a bigger starfire out. But if you're not wasting one, then it's good. Uh, the way umbral procs work, it's that it is, I think it's RPPM. So technically, you're not getting like back to back to back to back Umbral procs, right? So one thing that I do usually is when I just got a fresh Umbral proc, like it just happened, 
then I feel like I have a little bit of time before I need to use it. But if I if my Amber proc is like already like five seconds in or like eight seconds in or whatever, then I'm trying to get it out as fast as possible because otherwise I would be like wasting it or um, like uh, over capping. Uh, yeah, wasting it is the word. Um, but yeah, in this situation, I wouldn't have wasted it because I didn't get another one. So I guess in hindsight, uh, should have used mushrooms first, but probably whatever. And yeah, um, nothing too crazy anymore about this pool. I'm just going to go over uh, just skipping through some of the stuff here. On Veximus, something you want to do as a Moonkin is you do want to make sure um, that you're going bare form for the mana bombs on hierarchies. Because these mana bombs do a lot of damage and sometimes you get the overlaps with the boss's AoE plus the mana bombs going off and just does a lot of damage. So going into bear form, uh, even playing some like Orson's Vigor is sometimes also really good just to get the extra HP, which I'm playing here in this dungeon as well. And just make sure you use your stuff, right? As soon as you get a mana bomb, use Bark Skin. Just use the Bark Skin immediately as you get it uh, to make sure it's ready again for the next time. Um, use bear form. If you have Bark Skin up, Usually, even on, on like not so high keys, uh, sometimes when I have bark skin up, I will just not go bear form because I feel safe with bark skin. Um, and then when I don't have bark skin up, I will go bear form. Um, and yeah, use your renewal, use your healing, uh, use whatever you can to survive this. I'm not going to talk too much about single target just because single target uh, people should technically have figured it out by now, but that's that could be a whole different kind of video. But uh, yeah, uh, we're moving on here. We're actually pulling this pack, which is very dangerous. Um, here, I'm in this situation uh, that I talked about earlier, right? I have 100 Astro Power. I'm not in an Eclipse. And my Pulsar is about to proc. So technically, and I don't know if I'm doing this, but technically the course of action should be I'm applying Sunfire and Moonfire. And then I enter a Pulsar. Then I should just press Starfall. So let's see how I actually do that as well. So I'm applying my, my dots here, my Moonfires. Applying my Sunfire. And I actually did. <laughs> okay, so I did play it correctly, thank god. Uh, I should be casting my Mushrooms here as well. Oh yeah, I did already, never mind. And then I'm just using my, my Starfires. And I'm entering Eclipse as soon as my Pulsar drops again. Here our Monk died because we didn't have enough interrupts. Um... And again, I'm like staggering my mushrooms to make sure my waning stays on the mobs. Now I'm out of mushrooms for two seconds at least. Uh, I'm helping interrupting here as well with Typhoon, Vortex, Incabor. I'm just trying my best so my tank doesn't die and my, <laughs> my team doesn't die. Um, but yeah. And again, like same thing. We're pulling these Aconites and I know we're going to pull more. So again, I'm just casting one of my rafts first to preemptively, like to get closer to proccing my Eclipse. Then I'm putting my Moonfires up, I'm casting my Stella Flare um, to make sure that I'm kind of like not wasting my Sunfire. But here, as you can see, I'm actually casting Sunfire because at this point I have nothing else to do. So what what would I be doing, right? So I'm, I casted two flares on the left mobs and one flare on this mob. And now I have nothing else to do. So while I'm moving together, I'm still sun firing. Even though that means I'm going to waste my GCDs, right? But what else am I going to do um, other than sun firing these mobs while walking, right? So I'm just doing that. And then here I'm uh, using my cooldowns. Usually when you have your incarn up, your rotation is a lot easier because you don't have to worry about entering Eclipse, right? So as soon as you're inside your, your cooldowns, you can just, you know... Cast your Starfires, cast your Starfalls, your Mushrooms, whatever. I'm casting Stella Flares here as well, as you can see, uh, some of them at least. Um, but yeah, you can see I'm actually casting a lot of uh, Flares because I know I'm looking at this condition that I have less two set procs. But then the mobs are about to die and then at that point it's not really worth it casting Flares anymore if the mobs are dying that fast. We had some explosives go off here and we almost died. And yeah, this is about it. One more thing I want to talk about when it comes to these mobs here is that the invokers, they cast arcane missiles and they do a lot of damage. So either you want to assign each invoker to like a melee to make sure they can interrupt each of the missile casts. And if you're not doing that, um, what I usually do, because I have two ways of disrupting them. I have solar beam and I have incapor. So what I try to do is when I see uh, multiple casts go off, then I'll just use my solar beam. 
Or if I see a missile cast goes off on somebody that is not the tank, then I will try to use my interrupts. Because if somebody gets mis uh, casted missiles on and they're not a tank, they're very likely just going to die if it's a 45 key and a high key. So make sure you interrupt it as uh, much as you can and help people out. You can also Typhoon it as well to interrupt. Uh, so you actually have three ways of interrupting it. And yeah, then on the last boss, and the last boss, there's nothing too crazy. The one thing uh, that I do want to mention, especially if you do a lower key, is that the debuffs that you have on this boss actually give you a damage increase. And you can get those stacks on purpose if you wanted to. On higher keys, I do not recommend doing that because as, as you have three stacks, you will spawn this, um, the zone on the ground that then spawns those uh, orbs out, right? And on a higher key, you do run into space problems sometimes. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend getting stacks on purpose on higher keys, but on lower keys, you can see I have one stack now, and this is actually a damage increase. Stack, you can actually purposely walk into an orb, for example. The orbs don't do that much damage. Um, the orbs that come out of the of the stones that are being dropped by the players. But yeah, don't do it if you <laughs> if you feel like uh, that you would die, or if you feel like that um, you would be dropping too many stones or whatever. Other than that, nothing too crazy about this boss. One thing, of course, that can kill you really easily here is the breath. Um, the way the breath works is that it will target a random person and then cast breath on them. Now, the way you dodge it is um, technically pretty simple, but it's a really fast cast. Now, the one thing that you want to watch out, especially as a ranged player, is that you want to try to stay close because it's a cone breath. And whenever something is a cone, it's easier to dodge the closer you are to the target, obviously. Uh, because that's just how shapes work. <laughs> so um, as a moon can try to stay as close as possible. And if you don't want to stay close for some reason, like here, for example, I used my disengage to interrupt the dragon because sometimes the boss will just drag you in and then cast this like power vacuum. If you don't want to walk out normally because it's like a damage loss or whatever, then you can interrupt it by using disengage in moonkin form. The problem is if you do that, then you don't have disengage for the breath. Now, if that's something you want to do, then you just need to be aware that when the breath comes, your disengage will not be ready. So you have to either uh, slowly move closer to the boss after the vacuum is over, or you're just ready to like go catch him and, and like run away or whatever. But as you can see here, like I'm just like slowly moving closer after the vacuum is over. Uh, again, just moving closer, 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 because I know uh, I don't have my disengage ready. And there you go. So again, the power vacuum happens. I use my disengage. Now I know my disengage is in cooldown and you can see every time I have a global, I will just move closer. Uh, and then of course I'm dodging this as well. But yeah, now I'm so close that whenever the breath casts on me, I can just normally walk out of it without doing anything crazy. But yeah, if I was further away, like in my initial position, I probably either would have died or I had to use like cat form sprint or something to not, to not die. So yeah, that is how you want to play this boss. And yeah, that's it. I know Moonkin is really complicated right now. There's so many things to talk about. And this video is just like insanely long. I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, I try I, I hope there was information that you got that helped you guys. And I know I probably also repeated myself a lot, but uh, I just wanted to show you the same situation in different scenarios to give you a little bit of an idea on how to play or how I'm playing at least. And again, I'm gonna give you a disclaimer that uh, by no means am I playing anything perfectly. I think no one's really playing Moonkin perfectly right now because everyone's just kind of like doing whatever they feel like and they're trying out different builds and trying out different kind of rotations and yeah. So I'm not saying that what I am doing is like the perfect way of doing things, but I do think that if you give this a try, see if it works for you the way I'm playing and if it helps you, it helps you, that's great. If it doesn't help you and you end up losing damage, then go back to what you were doing. <laughs> Maybe that was better. But yeah, just try to give some tips and trying to explain to people why I'm doing what I'm doing. All right, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry that it was so long. And if you want more videos like these, like if you think that's actually helpful, then let me know in the comments below. 
And also, if you want to see a specific dungeon, let me know. If you want my commentary to be different, let me know. Like, if you want me to focus more on the dungeon mechanics rather than Moonkin stuff, or if you want me to focus on a different or explain a different talent build, or you want me to explain single target or whatever, just let me know and I can do more videos like these. All right? Okay, thank you so much for watching. Uh, have a nice rest of your day. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. That would be very nice. I would appreciate that a lot, please. And yeah, check out my stream over at twitch.tv slash Nagura if you have any more questions. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye.